bold, ambitious, brave. You may not recognize these women's faces or know their stories, but what they wrote, photographed, and broadcast revolutionized the narrative of World War II and paved the way for future female journalists. They were there when the bombs were going off and the battles were being fought. They were willing to go anywhere where the story was, but also they were incredibly adept at, at cultivating sources, at knowing who to talk to. And because of that, they regularly scooped their male counterparts, even interviewing Mussolini and Hitler. Hugely competitive, and she would drive through air raids literally to try and get to a phone faster than anyone. War reporting isn't easy for anyone, but as Judith McCrell writes in her book, The Correspondence, it was made even more difficult for these women who sought out clever and often dangerous ways to get the story. They were just finding loopholes and sneaking their way to the front. Since prejudices and bureaucratic restrictions barred them from the press corps until 1944. It, it was extraordinary. Author Judith McCrell introduces us to these six trailblazers and their harrowing experiences. There were death threats, there were threats to incriminate her as a spy, her phone was tapped, her sources were murdered, uh, and she kept on writing about the Nazi party until 1941, which was amazing. Plus, she talks about how she discovered their stories. And I was thinking, who is this extraordinary self-possessed young woman, um, not only to stand up to Hemingway, but to, you know, to, to, to be in that situation in the first place. And discusses their incredible highs and lows of reporting during World War II. It was this very kind of paradoxical thing that it was both the most exciting and fulfilling and complete experience of their lives when all of them had the satisfaction of feeling they were caught up in something so much larger than themselves, but then also knowing that it was an experience that had changed them utterly and made it very difficult for them to live an ordinary life again. First person one-on-one. -on -one. I'm your host, Angie Weidinger, and today I am so excited to be welcoming Judith McCrell. Thank you so much for being with us. Well, thank you for joining me. Tell me, where are you right now? So I'm in London um, in my study, which is at the top of the house, um, lovely big space uh, where I do nearly all of my writing. Kind of your escape. That's your happy place. Absolutely. As long as the book's going well. <laughs> right. <laughs> I drag myself to my desk. <laughs> yes, that totally makes sense. <laughs> well, I am so thrilled to be talking to you today about the correspondence. It was so inspiring, not just, I, I worked in news as a journalist, but beyond that, just as a, as a female, to see what these incredible women did. Um, you're a journalist as well. How, how did you come about writing this book because I know you normally cover dance and things of that sort, right? Yeah, tutus rather than tanks. Right, <laughs> right exactly. Um, yeah, I, yeah, I mean, for 30 years I worked as a dance critic, um, but I began writing biographies, uh, I guess, 2007, I think, and got the bug. Um, and got the bug not only because it's thrilling to write a book rather than meet the deadline with a 600 word review uh, but also because with each subject you know you you immerse yourself in a whole area that's new and you know it feels like doing a history degree with each one and with this war book um, I, I've always been fascinated by the second world war I think I'm of that generation where the war actually shaped our childhoods tremendously. You know, my brothers read war comics. There were very patriotic British war films all over the television, but we never learned about it in school. You know, it was too, it was too much like recent history. Oh, uh -huh. so, so I was very conscious of it, but I was also aware that there was a lot I didn't know about it. And it, 
I'd always kind of wanted to come to terms with it, to immerse myself in, in that period. And um, when I first came across one of my women, Helen Kirkpatrick, almost the least well known of them, I was so impressed by her as one of these few female journalists who'd actually made their way to the front lines of the Second World War that I wanted to find out if there were more of her. And once I found out that, yes, there was this small group of incredibly valiant women who'd battled against all the army regulations that were trying to keep them away from the battle zones, once I realized they'd all found their own ways to the war and had written heroically about battles, civilians, you know, all the aspects of war, I knew this was a book I wanted to write. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's just, like I said, it's inspiring. And, and it reads kind of like, you can almost see it like a movie playing out, you know, that the scenes are so vivid and, and you can picture it. Uh, so, so tell me how you ran across these six women, because they're not names that you would just know about. Weirdly, uh, I was out in Paris doing an assignment as a dance critic, interviewing the choreographer Christopher Wielden, who used to work a lot with New York City Ballet. And he was doing a new production of American in Paris. And we got talking about his main character who was based on the American heiress, Peggy Guggenheim, who featured in the book I was then currently writing about women who had lived in Venice. And Christopher said, oh, there's a brilliant book that I've been using for my research, he said, uh, which is a history of the Ritz Hotel in Paris. Uh, it's called the Hotel on Place Vendôme. And he said, there's some really wonderful anecdotes about the, the women I was then writing about. Uh, but in fact, it was the chapter on World War II that really gripped me because it had this fantastic anecdote about Helen. Uh, she'd been among the very first Allied journalists to be allowed into Paris after it was liberated in August 1944. And she had been invited the next day to lunch at the Ritz by Ernest Hemingway. And it was, you know, a very big boozy occasion. There were about six other male journalists there. And Hemingway was all full of, you know, basically he had liberated Paris <laughs> himself. <laughs> And, and wine and brandy was being bought out from the rich sellers that they'd managed to hide from the Nazis. And it was, a, you know, fantastic. And everybody's war stories were getting drunker and more preposterous as the lunch went on. But at a certain point, Helen said, uh, you know, basically, sorry, guys, this has been wonderful, but this, there's still news outside in the streets that I need to report. And Hemingway was are you crazy? Sit down, sit back down. You know, you'll never again be able to say that you're lunching with Hemingway at the Ritz the day after Paris was liberated and she, was, and she got up to leave. And then um, <laughs> as a result of her going, actually she scooped a story that none of those men got near, which was that uh, basically she, there was a service of Thanksgiving being held at Notre Dame Cathedral that afternoon led by General de Gaulle and three of the other French generals. And she decided to go there to see what was going on. And there was a huge crowd outside the cathedral and de Gaulle pitched up and the other generals in a huge car and everybody cheered and saluted, very emotional moment. Um, and at that point, no one knew that the Germans had left behind 50,000 troops in Paris to kind of harry the Allied troops, you know, prevent them taking over the city. And all around Notre Dame, even inside the cathedral, snipers were hidden to try and assassinate de Gaulle. And they started shooting on the crowd outside. Everybody, there was a stampede, obviously, into the cathedral to try and take shelter, except that, of course, the snipers were there. And as Helen reported, uh, Actually, only 25 people were killed in the end, but it was nearly a complete massacre. Wow. Uh, and so, of course, her story was plastered all over the Chicago Daily News, her paper the next day. And as far as she was aware, there was only one other journalist, a BBC correspondent, radio correspondent, who was also there. And 
well, I'd never heard of this incident uh, when de Gaulle was nearly murdered before, and I'd certainly never heard of Helen. And I was thinking, who is this extraordinary self-possessed young woman? Um, not only to stand up to Hemingway, but to, you know, to, to, to be in that situation in the first place. So that's, that's what got me going. Then, then there was Claire Hollingworth, who was British. She was pretty extraordinary. She'd only been a journalist for a week before she was sent to Poland in late August 1939. And when she managed to scoop first the fact that Germany had absolutely intent, every intention of invading Poland, despite the fact that the British and the French were all trying to negotiate and still hoping for peace. And secondly, um, actually, she was there also on the day that Germany did invade. And um, as, she, as the planes roared overhead and the tanks were rumbling, she rang up the British embassy in Warsaw and who were saying, no, 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 the invasion can't have begun because we're still at the negotiating table. And she put out the telephone receiver outside her window and said, well, listen to this. Right, right. This I is, beg to differ. Yeah. yeah. Differ. And then Martha Gellhorn famously married to the writer Ernest Hemingway, who was her introduction to war writing. I mean, they went to Madrid together to write about the Spanish Civil War. And actually, uh, I mean, Martha... Um, admitted she knew nothing about Spain, nothing about war. And in fact, the English title of my book is Going with the Boys. And that's a quote from one of Martha Gellhorn's letters when she manages to finagle her own way to Spain and says to a friend, I'm going with the boys. I don't know who the boys are, but I'm going with them. Um, and out in Madrid, it was interesting that um, Ernest actually gave Martha the best writing advice of her career because as a complete uh, ingenue, if you like, she had no idea how you wrote about war. And she kept fretting, you know, didn't some really cataclysmic battle have to happen before I can file a story? And he said, no, you know, here you are in the middle of Madrid, it's besieged, uh, the, the, the Republican forces are circled, encircled by Franco's nationalist forces. Uh, you're in a city under siege, none of your American readers will have experienced this, a city where, although they're being shelled two or three times a day, there are still Marx Brothers movies playing in the cinema, <laughs> you can still get your nails yeah. done in the last beauty, so you can even get a tram ride to the nearest front. He said, you, you write about, you are the eyes, the ears, the hearts and the minds of your readers and uh, you must write to, so that they can experience almost firsthand what it's like. And, you know, Martha Gellhorn did write some amazing war journalism, which is collected in this volume, The Face of War. Lee Miller, who's the other better known of my women, was the most unlikely of the war correspondents because she'd been cover girl at Vogue in her 20s. As a photographer, she had had her apprenticeship with Man Ray, the great American surrealist. So she'd been a darling of Left Bank Paris. She'd done a lot of society photographs, beauty, fashion. So world, uh, world events had never impacted on her at all until she came to London in 1939 and war became this really urgent and inspiring subject for her. And the extraordinary thing is, is that um, she taught herself to be a writer as well. So she, she, she was in France and Germany uh, in the last year and a half of the war, writing these amazing 10,000 word photo essays, sending back harrowing pictures of the fighting of the concentration camps. And all of it was published in British Vogue. You think of what Vogue is now, you know, complete right. fashion Bible, sort of celebrity handbook to think that, these extraordinary, I mean, some of the most um, brilliant, direct, harrowing reporting of the war, and it was in Vogue, <laughs> in the pages of Vogue. As I sort of Googled around all these different women, you know, names come up and you start seeing, okay, well, who else will fit into my jigsaw? So there was <laughs> a woman called Virginia Coles, 
who actually Martha met in Madrid. And she started out life, Virginia started out life uh, as a society columnist, but she had high ambitions to, um, to write serious news. Uh, but she was also very conscious that her particular glamour and charm would get her a long way. So <laughs> he turned up in Madrid wearing a kind of little wool, elegant wool tailored dress, a little fur jacket and high heel black suede shoes. And Martha and Ernest Hemingway, who already considered themselves old hands, were like, you know, does she think this is a tea party? Or, But um, Virginia and Martha became very good friends and Martha recognised that Virginia was an extraordinary, brave and uh, intrepid and courageous and honourable reporter like herself. Um, there was another woman I discovered called Sigrid Schultz, uh, who was an American citizen, but born of German Norwegian parents. She was amazing because she was based in Berlin from 1913 uh, as bureau chief of Berlin from 1925. And she reported on the whole of the rise of Hitler and the Nazi party and on the first two years of the war from there. So although she didn't actually report on any fighting till 1944, Berlin was sort of like her front line uh, and she was incredibly brave. Um, there were death threats, there were threats to incriminate her as a spy, her phone was tapped, her sources were murdered uh, and she kept on writing about the Nazi party until 1941, which was amazing. But the most extraordinary thing, and this I only discovered halfway through writing the book, when I met up with a group of local historians from the town where uh, Sigrid retired in America, that all her life she'd kept secret the fact that her mother was Jewish and that by Nazi reckoning, she herself was a Jew. So to have stayed in Berlin, to have reported on you know, the harrowing persecution of the Jews, all the while knowing that if this fact was discovered about her, I mean, it, 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 it beggars belief. And uh, I have to say writing this book as I did quite a lot through the pandemic, you know, when one was faced with, you know, all the anxieties and deprivations of lockdown and everything, I'd come to my desk each morning and actually think, you know, this is nothing. You know, <laughs> right. Put themselves through. As you spoke, you hinted on earlier, I mean, they had so many barriers, so they had to do things that were, while people were running in the opposite direction, they were, they were going. It was just... Exactly, exactly. I mean, it wasn't until November uh, 1944 that the British and Americans decided that women could join the official press corps which meant that they could then travel in official press transport, they could sleep in the press camps, they could have access to daily press briefings, all, all, the, all the facilities that the men had taken for granted throughout right. the war. But it meant that for those early years, uh, my six women, uh, either they were reporting from areas of the war where the British and the American didn't have jurisdiction, uh, or they were just finding loopholes and sneaking their way to the front. Um, and if they were Martha Gellhorn, who wanted desperately to report on the Normandy landings in June 44, and was furious that um, of all, all the journalists who were allowed to cross were men, cross the channel were men, uh, she simply got herself on board a hospital ship found an empty bathroom, locked herself in, and rode to France Stairway. And, uh, and because she was in a hospital ship when they arrived at, at Normandy at Omaha Beach, she was then needed to help with the medical teams to go uh, on shore and help to ferry back the in injured soldiers back on board the ship for treatment. It meant she was one of the very, very few journalists um, who actually was set foot on Omaha Beach on that Normandy coastline uh, at the beginning of the invasion. And she certainly outscooped her husband, Ernest, yeah. <laughs> uh, who was still on board one of the little assault crafts and um, making up stories about 
how he'd personally liberated France. <laughs> <laughs> right. And I think all of them, you know, when they came across hardship or suffering, uh, even when it wasn't their job, they, they would try and help. I mean, I think that was one of the, well, one of the many harrowing things about being a journalist then and now is you find yourself in a situation where um, huge numbers of people are displaced or hungry or injured and you kind of do what you can. And it's a tiny amount, but I don't think any of them lost, it, it, none of them became hardened to yeah. the suffering of individuals. And, and, and I think that's also a crucial feature of uh, most of their reporting too was that they they felt war was never just about military tactics and battle procedure. It was about they they tried to evoke what it was like for individuals, whether it was individual soldiers or individual civilians, you know, to to put that at the heart of their reporting. Um, and there were men who did that too, but I think it was quite a, it was a more distinctive feature of women reporters. I think they were kind of allowed to do that perhaps more than the men were. Mm -hmm. And certainly that's what they wanted to do. Um, and it's interesting if you talk to um, some of today's women correspondents, foreign correspondents, um, they, they regard these women as, as kind of the, gener the generation of pioneers and also as, the, as examples to which they Need, feel they need to live up and and that that notion of, of of always being alert to the human individual in a war and and the human dimension of war um i think is 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 is, is also a striking characteristic of women reporting today what i find so interesting about your book is that i mean you tell the history of world war ii but the perspective is so unique um, and and then and to give the female perspective, but then also to show what kind of impact it had, not only on the soldiers, but on these women who were doing and seeing such horrific things, you know, how it impacted their families and lives. They were all these women, while they loved their work and they were all, I think, became addicted to the adrenaline of war yeah. and war reporting and and that extraordinary sensation of kind of living on a knife edge of life and death. You know, I think, I think that does become such a way of life. At the same time, the things that they saw, uh, that, that affected all of them. Um, and particularly uh, the four who entered the concentration camps uh, and realized, you know, exactly what it was that, the Germans were capable of and, and exactly what it was they'd been fighting. I mean, for Sigrid in particular, who'd spent so much of her career trying to warn the world about Nazi Germany and, and what depths it was capable of. I think in a way she suffered the most because going into Buchenwald and seeing just, you know, that it was even worse and even more horrific than she had ever dared to imagine and knowing that she'd failed somehow as a journalist to prevent it I think that that stayed with her all her life and and she could never forgive Germany she hated Germany with a passion you know even when Germany was rebuilding itself and trying to come to terms with the shame of the Hitler era she would never allow that there was any redemption for the nation really and for for um I mean, Martha Gellhorn too, she, she felt that when she went into the concentration camps, she lost, I think she said, some, some kind of essential faith and capacity for happiness in her life. Uh, she said it was like, it was as though I, I fell off a cliff, she said, when I walked through the gates of Dachau and suffered a form of concussion ever since. And, and Lee Miller definitely suffered from very severe post-traumatic stress for yeah. decades afterwards and hardly ever spoke of the war. I think, I mean, it's not just true of these women, it's true of an awful lot of male soldiers, male journalists as well, that, you know, coming back after the war, 
when you've seen so much and you've been in this intense world, it, it, it was, there was a barrier between them and their wives and families and friends who hadn't experienced it. You know, it was very difficult for them to get over it. And yet, you know, for a lot of them, Helen writing from the trenches of France saying, you know, I've never been so happy in my life. <laughs> saying this is the greatest experience I'll ever go through. Um, Lee, who pitches up in San Marlo uh, on the Normandy coast in late August 1944, thinking she's going to be writing about um, the civil affairs units, which were the teams that were sent in by the Americans to liberated towns in order to um, try and create order. Uh, only when she arrived in St. Malo did she realize that some intelligence wires had been crossed. And in fact, St. Malo hadn't been liberated at all, that there were still German troops encircling the city and that there was huge fighting going on. And Lee, far from thinking, oh God, I must get out of here. This is really dangerous. Yeah. yeah. Was like, I'm in the middle of my own private war. Because <laughs> there were no journalists, there were no photographers around. And her instinct was simply to, you know, to be absolutely jubilant and to stay for yeah. as long as allowed. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, it, it was this very kind of paradoxical thing that it was both the most exciting and fulfilling and complete experience of their lives when all of them had the satisfaction of feeling they were caught up in something so much larger than themselves. Yeah. Um, but then also knowing that it was an experience that had changed them utterly and made it very difficult for them to live an ordinary life again. As people read this, journalists, women, what do you hope the takeaway is? I mean, or what is the takeaway, you know, that you experienced? Um, well, I, I think it's it's been great the last few years how uh, war historians are now acknowledging how many the importance of the female voice you know not simply that what women suffered but also what women contributed to the fighting of wars and the reporting of wars so I would I'd, I, I would be proud to think that I've added to that knowledge about women in war um, I'd like to to correct perhaps the misconception that that generation were, you know, quite conventional, quite, you know, not great feminists. I mean, they were, um, they were hugely competitive with each other, but they, <laughs> they believed they were as good as, if not better than men, and they went out to prove it. But I think on on a on a wider political level, um, particularly as we've just passed Armistice Day and all that recognition of the millions who died fighting wars. Um, I think all my women had a very strong perception after the Second World War was over, that although it had been an absolutely just and noble war, that in the end, nothing much had changed and that governments still needed to be held to account and that you know, the, the struggle for a more civilized world, you know, didn't end with the Second World War and, and that do wars even um, bring that about? So it's, an, it's odd, I guess, writing about war, I would like people to take away a message of peace. It is an inspiring book. It's yeah. fascinating to read about history in a different way, history that you think, you know, you, you, you understood, but to see it from a different perspective is, is fascinating. Well, thank, thank you so much for talking to me. Such wonderful questions. Oh, well, thank you for this. Thank you for your time. And hopefully we'll get to talk to you in person sometime soon. That would be great. That would be great. Okay. Okay.